Today we're going to be talking about, we're still in the celebrations of discipline, and uh, today we're going to, it's an interesting, and if you talk to Rick, and it's just been a struggle, you know, and ironically, it's the discipline of, <laughs> of simplicity, and it's been the hardest one to kind of wrap ourselves around, and um, let me do this, uh, who doesn't have a book? If you don't have a book, raise your hand, it's okay. Uh, Patty, if you would, I, it, we have one, two, six books. They need to all be gone today, or I'm going to go donate, donate them somewhere because they don't do any good on a shelf. Miriam as well. So we got two left. And there's one journal if you want, if you want a journal. There is a journal associated with this uh, as well. Oh, the book is, it's just, it will challenge you and continue to challenge you. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those classic, they call it a classic for a reason. You know, it really has the core things that we need to deal with in our faith. And uh, there's one more. One more. Who, come on. Everybody has one? No, Lynn doesn't have one. Give, give it to Lynn. Oh, you got one? Oh, you're waving at Eden. <laughs> Eden, don't go out the door. All right. Well, uh, somebody out there out there needs one, so we'll, we'll get it to him. Does Stephen have one? Yeah. Well, let's give. I, I bet you money he doesn't. Give give, uh, give that to Nicole, and we'll get that to Stephen. There you go. And by the way, uh, happy birthday, Stephen. I know you're not feeling well this morning, but 80 years old is nothing to sneeze at. Wow, we got birthdays all over the place. All right, so here we go. If you had to describe what a simple life was, what might you say? No job. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> However, let's ask our retired folks is it a simple. <laughs> But I get you. <laughs> no job. What else? A simple life. What does a simple life look like? Hmm? Humble. We born with Brad brought us to what it was. So this morning Brad brought us to what it was. A life of simplicity is a life without worry. Which comes from only one place. It comes from only one place. Absolutely. Absolutely. It comes from our faith. It lands. <laughs> Him? Yes. <laughs> the guy who came up and talked about cornhole a minute ago? <laughs> See, God can use anybody. <laughs> gratitude. gratitude. Simple life includes gratitude. Albert. So just wake up, no wars, no, no, none of that stuff, and just a good day. Lynn, is that a hand? No, just distractions are minimal or, or out of the way. Yeah, that would be a more simple life. Anybody else? Being content regardless of our, Paul wrote about that, our circumstances. Christy, what would it look like? It's a tough one. Ah, calm and peace, that shalom stuff. Mm. Yeah, that it exists no matter what and whatever happens, we can walk into it even if it's tough. <laughs> or especially <laughs> when, it's, when it's tough. Knowing you're taken care of, faith, knowing, trusting that there is a God and he cares for you and he's walking right beside you and, and whatever happens is okay because of that. It's going to be okay no matter how it turns out. Simple life. The Christian discipline of simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. You're going to get this morning because um, I'm not, I, can't, I just, I've worked on this and worked on this and worked on this, and I kept going back to Foster because he, he did such an amazing job with this. 
you're going to get a lot of Foster this morning. You're going to get as much of him as you do of me. Um, but I'll let you know that and where those things are. And read the book. <laughs> it's inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. It's stuff that's going on inside that transforms the actions that we take in life. Both the inward and outward aspects of simplicity are essential. Here's a simple truth. You might have heard this before. You cannot encounter the living God without experiencing significant inward change to your heart and to your mind. And this encounter then results in a significant change in how we live. Let me do that again. You cannot encounter the living God. Think about that. The creator of all, you're having an encounter with him. Are you going to be changed? Yeah, you can't help it. it you know, he's going to move, and, and, and you're going you're to experience that inward change to your heart and mind, and then that is what results in the outward change in how we live our lives. It can't be otherwise. It just can't. The touch of God is transformative. It's renewing. It does not conform to the pattern of the world around us. In the world, we often crave things that we don't... <laughs> we, we neither need and often don't even enjoy. You know, it's just Christmas. Great example is, what did you get for Christmas five years ago? <laughs> but it was so important. Three years ago? Socks? <laughs> An engagement ring. Ah, there you go. That, see? That's significant, you know? What else did you get? <laughs> COVID. <laughs> Tis the season, right? Wow. <laughs> I actually went, got it at Christmas, too. We probably had it at the same time. <laughs> a couple, yeah. You know, it's funny. Those things that we have to have suddenly become, meh, in our lives once we get them. We have this constant yearning for the next thing that will provide us contentment and happiness and joy and respect and honor and love. So we sometimes buy stuff because an advertiser tells us to. Did you know that? <laughs> we don't like to admit it all the time, but it's true. We have channels on the TV that are there for one purpose. Sell you stuff. QVC, and it used to just be QVC. I don't even know how many there are now, but there's a bunch of them. Um, our cars. Our cars need to be replaced before they're actually done, and we buy the latest fa fashion so that we can be in or buy more of what we don't need because we don't really know why. We just do it. We, you know, it's like, I need that. I need that. When you're leaving a store, what are you likely to, if the line is long, what are you likely to walk out with? <laughs> candy, yeah, they, they put all that stuff right there. Candy in a magazine, if you're into magazine. You know, it's, they put that stuff there for a reason, so that while you're waiting and perusing, it's like, oh, payday. I had a payday in a while. I kind of, uh, uh, I'm suddenly hungry. <laughs> Peanuts are on the Daniel Fast. <laughs> I don't know about caramel, but... <laughs> <laughs> we buy stuff we don't need, or we play the comparison game. Yeah, you familiar with the comparison game? We buy stuff because our neighbors or our friends or our family bought cool stuff, and we need to keep up with them. See, our culture is unbalanced when it comes to uh, obtaining stuff. And we need to realize that as Christians, we are actually supposed to be different. We're called to live differently from this world of ours, to live in the world, but not of the world. And this is a complicated, materialistic world that we live in. And simplicity is a way of life for the Christian that keeps us different from the ways of the world. Richard Byrd, he was an explorer. Read that for me. Yeah, he went, to South, he went North Pole. North Pole, South Pole. He went to one of the poles where it's really cold. <laughs> you know, North Pole. Antarctica, so he went to South Pole, and he was there, and, and he found out, you know, I don't need all this stuff. I went on a mission trip to, I've uh, been on several, but th this one that sticks out is to Nicaragua 
And, you know, I was there, and these kids were having a ball. They had nothing, you know, running down. It, they had a river. <laughs> you know, they'd go down to the river, and they'd hang out, and they'd, they were just having a ball. They'd make up. A, they didn't have a baseball, so they'd get something that was kind of round, you know, and use that and, and just were able to live. We went to Kenya, and I got to tell you, man, these... The, the system over there is, is such that, um, you know, accumulation of goods is not an issue for most of Kenyans and, uh, unless you're in the big cities, you know. And, then, and that will all change as we modernize, I'm sure. But it was really cool to see and, um, and different. It was different for sure. Here's the thing. We don't have to go to the North Pole or the South Pole to figure that out. Simplicity is a way to order our outward life, our opinions, our attitudes about money and finances and stuff. Did you know that the Bible is not silent when it comes to economic issues and our attitudes? And I don't know how many of us are reading the book, but I'm going to go heavy on Foster starting now. This is from him. The Bible and Simplicity. Before attempting to forge a Christian view of simplicity, it's necessary to destroy the prevailing notion that the Bible is ambiguous about economic issues. Often it is felt that our response to wealth is an individual matter, but the Bible's teaching in this area is said to be strictly a matter of private that the Bible's teaching is a matter of private interpretation. We try to believe that Jesus didn't address himself to practical economic questions. Here's the thing. No serious reading of Scripture can substantiate such a view. The biblical injunctions against the exploitation of the poor and the accumulation of wealth are clear and straightforward. The Bible challenges nearly every economic value of contemporary society. For example, the Old Testament takes exception to the popular notion of an absolute right to own private property. The earth belongs to God. Leviticus 25, 23. Go ahead and read it for me. Land must not be permanently sold. The land is God's, and we're just we're we're borrowing it for a, for a while. And Foster goes on. The Old Testament legislation of the year of jubilee stipulated that all land was to revert back to its original owner. In fact, the Bible declares that wealth itself belongs to God, and one purpose of the year of Jubilee was to provide a regular redistribution of the wealth. There's different views about that. That's not Foster, that's me. Such a radical view of economics flies in the face of nearly all contemporary belief and practice. That is not the American dream. Had Israel faithfully observed the Jubilee, it would have dealt a death blow to the perennial problem of the rich becoming richer and the poor becoming poorer. Leviticus again. Go ahead and read that for me. It's a little complex, but... Forty-nine years. Y'all want me to take it on for you? <laughs> you shall make the 50th year holy. So 49 years and then the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. It's the year you'll make it holy, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee to you. And each of you shall return to his own property. Each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a Jubilee to you. In it you shall not sow, neither reap that which grows of itself, nor gather from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. God would provide, is what he's saying. You shall eat of its increase out of the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. Every 50 years, you got to go back to your property. Now, there is, there's a lot of information about it. There's compensation and some things that go with that. But... The land was God's. 
and you got to borrow it. Foster goes on, he says, constantly the Bible deals decisively with the inner spirit of slavery that an idolatrous attachment to wealth brings. Whew. Psalm 62.10. Go ahead, I'm going to let you read to me today. No, it doesn't say that riches can't increase. It just says, don't set your heart on them. The Tenth Commandment is against covetousness. What? In the big, in the top ten? Somebody tell me what all ten are. No. It's like. But hear this. This is the, you know, this is the thou shalt not murder. This is honor your father and mother. There's only one God, you know. This is that ten. And the tenth is against covetousness. It's important. It's a top ten item. Oh, yeah, Foster. The tenth commandment is against covetousness, the inner lust to have, which leads to stealing and depression. Here's another verse. Sorry, you just assume that I, unless I start reading it, just assume I'm asking you. If you trust in riches, I'm going to continue to make a distinction here. Are riches bad? No. If you trust in riches, that's a problem. If you rely on riches, that's not good. And we'll get to a very clear Jesus statement. Jesus declared war on materialism in his day, this Foster, and Foster says, and I would suggest that he would declare war on materialism in our day. The Aramaic word for wealth is mammon, and Jesus condemns it as a rival god. And most translations now say you cannot serve God and money. But it's a bigger word than that. You know? Jesus, you can't have those two masters. It won't work. So I'm going to move, deviate a little bit from the book because it just keeps going. It's, here, here's another one. Wait, what? The poor? So we're all supposed to be poor, right? No, no. Well, blessed are the poor. And I hope, I hope we figure this out by the end of this morning. I'm telling you. What does that mean, received your consolation? Yeah, their reward has happened here, right? So, so it's, and there's a lot of passages that, that, that say that. And I think I got one here in a little bit, too. But, but the reward that they receive is here. And the kingdom reward is for others. Wow. There your heart will be also. And by the way, there are many, many more. There are over 2,000, 2,000 verses about money and wealth. Jesus warns us against wealth and some of the desires and attitudes that come with it. And, I, and to just keep driving at home, is money bad? No. Is wealth bad? No. Love of money? Yeah. I'll read this one. Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a person's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Or sell your possessions and give alms. Provide yourselves with purses that don't grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Those are out of Luke. Or the parable of the rich farmer whose life centered on hoarding as he built a second silo. You know what happened to him? 
He died. He never got to use that second silo because he was storing up his treasures where? On earth. And, and he was called into the kingdom. You know, we must be willing to let go of everything, to let everything go, sell everything we have to get, the, get it as the pearl merchant story tells us, that pearl of great price. Jesus spoke on economic issues more than any other single social issue. It's a big deal. Have you ever wondered why talking about money in church bothers so many people? We say things like, the church is only out for money. But it's more likely that we aren't using our money for the benefit of God's kingdom, so we don't like hearing that where your treasure is, there your heart is. Here's a slide, and I love who they attributed this to. Oh, you can't hardly read it. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. J.K. Rowling. It's on the internet. It has to be true. <laughs> you think the Bible got it before J.K.? Another interesting thing, the ones who tend to hear the message are the least able to afford to give extravagantly to the work of God in the world. It's an intriguing paradigm. Folks with money often have a harder time giving it away than those who don't have much. And this is what God knows about us, that money, <laughs> money complicates our lives. The more we have, the greater difficulty we have parting with it, even for kingdom work. It's a thing called morism. Morism complicates things. Morism affects our inward attitude, which impacts our outward life. Morism keeps us from simplicity, such as giving a tithe. A tithe is what? The first 10%. An offering, you want to give more than that. Tithes and offerings, we pray for tithes and offerings. Tithes is the first 10%. But think about this. What if you made a million dollars a year? How much is 10% of that? Holy cow, you want me to do what? 100 grand? I don't think I can do that. You made 100,000. It's 10,000. That's hard to do. Even though, from God's perspective, he would probably tell us that, well, you got a million, give 100, you got 900,000 left. Can you live on that? Not everybody. <laughs> if you make 100000 a year, you have 90000 left. That's just the way it works. And the irony is folks with less money do tend to give a higher percentage of their wage. If a, I won't, you know, I'm not going to tell you giving here, but it's just a weird thing that some of our biggest givers are not the, some of those who, who make the most money. It's just an interesting dynamic. Still, simplicity is 10%. That's God, right? The one who gave up his only son for us. But we as people don't tend to do simple. We like to do complicated. And hear this as well, because simplicity is not the swearing off of possessions or the swearing off of purchasing things. Simplicity doesn't mean that you hate money and that you don't hate the people who have an abundance of it. Simplicity is not the desire to be poor and to remain that way. Foster pointed this out. He said asceticism and simplicity are mutually incompatible. Asceticism renounces possessions. Simplicity sets possessions in their proper perspective. Ascetics were like the monks who went and lived in caves and they withdrew from the world. They were out of the world and out of the world. <laughs> they were not in the world. They weren't participating in the world. And Foster points out, he says, paying, he says, paying little attention to the physical realm of existence and avoiding all forms of indulgence, which is asceticism and simplicity, are mutually incompatible. They just don't go together. We're supposed to be in the world and not of the world. We're in the world, though, in the world. You know, those monks, you might even say it's a famous old saying that they were <laughs> too spiritual to be any earthly good. You know? God's creation is good. God's creation is meant to be enjoyed, just not our first focus and not our first 
worry. So let me go back to Foster. Archimedes once declared, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. In other words, if he could give him a place to stand and he could impact what he was focusing on. And such a focal point is important in every discipline, but is acutely so with simplicity. The majority of Christians have never seriously wrestled with the problem of simplicity. Let me read that again. I think that's true, because I haven't seriously spent, well, I can't say that anymore. This week has been interesting. The majority of Christians have never seriously wrestled with the problem of simplicity, conveniently ignoring Jesus' many words on the subject. And the reason is simple. This discipline directly challenges our vested interests in an affluent lifestyle. But those who take the biblical teaching on simplicity seriously are faced with severe temptations towards legalism. In the earnest attempt to give concrete expression in Jesus' economic teaching, it's easy to mistake our particular expression of the teaching for the teaching itself. In other words, you need to do what I tell you because I'm right. I have your answer. That's legalism. I'm the one. I, I'll tell you how this works, and it's here. I think I'll post that slide because it's better when you can read it. It says, legalism rules our Lord. It perverts the holiness of God with human rules. It produces arrogance, oppression, inconsistency, and hypocrisy. Lordship, Jesus, is Lord. Holiness and liberty. God's Spirit produces holiness and provides liberty or freedom. License. I am Lord. Perverts liberty with human standards of behavior. Produces arrogance, unholiness, lukewarmness. Our goal is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's easy to say Jesus is my Savior. It's really hard to live Jesus is my Lord. My, the, my master, the one that I follow. It's tough stuff. Foster, in the earnest attempt to give concrete expression to his economic teachings, Jesus says, it's easy to mistake our particular expression of, of the teaching for the teaching itself. We wear the attire or buy that kind of house and canonize our choices, our choices as the simple life. The danger gives special importance of finding and clearly articulating an Archimedean focal point of simplicity. It's a great word, canonize. You know what the Bible is called? It's our canon. Canonize, to treat our choices as the right choices for everyone. Legalism happens when we lose our humility and decides what's best for all. We need to be secure in our understanding. Don't miss, you know, we need to stop. You know, you may have heard this last week. We need to study. We need to, you know, dive in and dive in deep. We're trying to understand the creator of all things, who he is, what he would have us to be and do, and what God's will is. And that requires a heavy, heavy dose of humility and understanding. We come to him humbly, yet boldly. He wants us to come. Back to Foster. We have such a focal point in the words of Jesus, Matthew 6, 25 through 33. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? <laughs> Here, let me do it again. Are you not much more valuable than they? Yeah. Thank you. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No. And why do you worry about clothes? See, the flowers and the fields, they don't labor or spend. You got to tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, ye of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given 
to you as well. So we, we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness first. It, this is simplicity. This, the central point of the discipline of simplicity is to seek the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God first. And then everything necessary will come in its proper order, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everything hinges on us maintaining God first, our focus on God first. Nothing must come before the kingdom of God. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the kingdom of God. And a life of simplicity is not to have anxiety about material stuff. So, so let me ask you, what does that mean to you, putting the kingdom first? What does it mean? It's a tough question. We don't consider it very often. What does it mean to put the kingdom of God first? Make him a priority in your life. Absolutely. The priority, the priority in your life. Still that, that first thing. Live your life in such a way that you get to his kingdom. Now, yeah, rely on Jesus, right? Jesus is how, we, how that happens. Know that trust in, uh, you know, it's similar, right? That's, you know, know that he'll trust and provide your needs. Putting the kingdom first. We did a whole series on heaven, right? What does the kingdom look like? <laughs> Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> it's going to be this better. This better, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be even even more beautiful. Glad I'm yeah, glad I'm coming back. I get to experience all, you know, all of all of the kingdom first. You know, these things kind of tie together. Albert, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, the, the kingdom in he heaven is going to be very different from now. It's going to be better than, than now. So when we talk about living a kingdom life, you know, consider that because it's something to think about. It's what does it look like? How, how do I have this, this kingdom lifestyle in, in my life and in my heart? How do I do that? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. How do I get that? How does that happen? Now, I'm not, there's, there's 10 controlling principles for the outward expression of simplicity that now we'll get to, but I'm not going to go through in depth, if that's okay. I'm telling you, this thing is just please get, please, please read the book. Please get into what he's saying and, you know, wrestle. Wrestle with it, because this is stuff you got to wrestle with. This is not easy stuff. This is stuff that you get. It's going to push. It, they put it, it pushes on some of my buttons, you know, and, and it's hard. But Foster says this. He says, number one, buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. He's giving you tools. That's what I love about Richard. He's like, he's not just saying this. And then he says, here's some tools in order to pull this off and what it might look like. Uh, consider cars for the utility that they are, homes for livability, uh, clothes are often bought not because they're needed, but for fashion. He suggests wear your clothes out. I think I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> I like new stuff, though. He continues, reject anything that's producing an addiction in you. And here he meddles. You know, he gets to meddling a lot. He says, learn to distinguish between a real need, uh, like cheerful surroundings, 
and, you know, friends and, and, that, and an addiction. Eliminate or cut down on the use of addictive non-nutritional drinks, alcohol, coffee, tea, Coca-Cola, and so on. Chocolate has become a serious addiction for many people. TV can be addicted, and it goes on. You know, there's just a lot of things that get between us and God. Develop a habit of giving things away. If you're too attached to something, give it to someone who needs it. De-accumulate. Refuse to be propagandized by the custodians of modern gadgetry. I am, uh, this, this one is, I like, I like cool stuff, though. <laughs> you know, I got a new Xbox. Here's the thing, though, time sa- and, and stuff like time-saving devices, you know what? They, <laughs> they rarely save any time. Beware of the promise. It'll pay for itself in six months. <laughs> Here's what interesting one. Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Owning is an obsession in our culture. If we own it, we feel we can control it. If we can control it, we feel it will give us more pleasure. And Foster asserts, this is an illusion. Number six, develop a deeper appreciation for creation. Walk, listen to the birds, get out, pay it. If you get knocked out by a, by a sunrise and you've got the time to pull over and just look, bask in it. Seven, look with a healthy skepticism at every buy now, pay later scheme. They're a trap, put you in bondage. They want you to start paying interest, usury in the Bible. Number eight, obey Jesus' instructions about plain, honest speech. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you consent to do a task, do it. If you can't do it, don't consent to it. You know, it's it's okay to say no. I'm one of those that struggles with that. I know there's a bunch of us in here that do. It's okay to say no. Nine, reject anything that breeds the oppression of others. Foster says, may God give us prophets today who, like Quaker John Woolman, will call us from the desire of wealth so that we may be able to break the yoke of oppression. Ten, shun anything that distracts you from seeking first the kingdom of God, whether that's job, position, status, family, friends, security. They can become the center of attention, and that's not healthy as a Christian seeking to follow Christ first and seek ye First, the kingdom of God. Thanks a lot, Richard. Love you. Did I mention this is challenging? Even so, a life of simplicity is to use what wealth you have for God first. A life of simplicity is to keep the sinful drive to want things in its proper perspective. Simplicity accepts that everything you have is a gift from God. A life of simplicity accepts God's care of what we have. Admits that everything we own should be available for others if needed. We buy things for their usefulness, not status. We reject things that produce unhealthy results in us. Develop a habit of giving things away. And I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but please take the time to read this book and this chapter and I know it's hard, and I know it's challenging, and, and take your time, because I, I wanted to breeze through this, and guess what? I couldn't, because there's too much. But it's okay, because life is challenging. Have you noticed? <laughs> Following Christ, it's challenging. In this world of ours, we have more opportunities to complicate things than to keep them simple. So let me kind of try to simplify the end of the morning. I know there's a lot of information. I'm always hesitant when going into this because it's like at some point it's like, I'm full, you know, it's Calvin and Hobbes. It's like, teacher, can I go home? (laughs) So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus was challenged by the religious leaders of his day. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
we're going to do stuff wrong. Default back to here when you get in a rough spot. You know, and keep working. Keep working. When things get complicated, return to the passage. Remember that the love of God, love of neighbor, that's what all of the law, which is the, 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 the Bible and the prophets, hang on. If the thing you're wrestling with or wanting to do doesn't show love of God or love of neighbor, rethink it. We've got a lot of stuff going on in the world and in the church. If we're not loving each other in the midst of it, rethink how we're going about it. Let go of anything that distracts you from seeking first the kingdom of God. Kingdom building is the thing that we are to seek first. To do so is to find a way to live a life of simplicity. So wrestle with that question this week. What does kingdom living look like for me? Amen.